Folks, if uh, we could go ahead and take seats, we're going to get started this morning. First of all, thank you to everyone for coming and joining us for what we anticipate is going to be a pretty good romp uh, over the next three days. We're covering a lot of area, have, as I think all of you know, uh, some extraordinary speakers here from the legal field and beyond. Uh, my name is Tom Martin. I'm a judge of the U.S. District Court in the District of Kansas. And uh, my only real responsibility here, apart from uh, a, a program this afternoon, uh, with a friend is to welcome you all. And I always have a feeling at these programs that we're kind of preaching to the choir because you're all here because you're interested and you're concerned about a lot of the things we're going to be talking about. But as I think most of you understand, this is not going to be a nuts and bolts approach to things. Uh, the folks that we have on our faculty for the next three days uh, are among the foremost thinkers uh, in the areas where we're doing our work. And they are here to challenge you and to try to inspire you to take a look at the way uh, you do your work the way we do our work uh, in a slightly different way. Uh, I don't know about the rest of you, but I think uh, most uh, folks find themselves in a small rut of some kind or a very deep one at some point in their career, and it's good to get jolted out of it and to move in some different directions or at least start thinking about our work in a slightly new and I hope refreshing way. Just a couple of quick announcements. Uh, introductions are going to be very limited so we can spend as much time as possible uh, on the content of the programs. Second thing is in terms of a couple of changes today, uh, the 16th Street Baptist Church presentation is actually going to run through two periods, and so lunch will be an abbreviated 45 minutes today uh, so that we can uh, stay on schedule. Uh, third thing is we have sign-up sheets. Some of our presenters and some of our judge attendees have uh, uh, indicated an interest in going to lunch or dinner. Uh, with uh, five or six persons so that you have an opportunity to visit and get acquainted and maybe explore in a little more detail some of the things that were talked about. So find the sign-up sheets and get signed up if you're, inter if you're interested. And the last thing, uh, oh, Aaron Fine, uh, our uh, architect and sculptor, had to cancel at the last minute, so he will not be with us uh, this afternoon. Uh, but there are other programs going on at the same time, and I hope you'll find something that, that interests you there. And finally, uh, we are uh, providing for a lot of CLE credit over the next few days, and frankly, uh, that is going to impair in uh, some uh, uh, sometimes significant uh, ways uh, your local bar associations. And I think over the years there's been a tendency to shy away from bar associations. You're not sure what the value is. Uh, as I look here today and I see my old partner Bob Wise, uh, who was my mentor in the practice all those years ago in McPherson, it was important to go to bar association meetings and to support uh, your bar associations. And I hope for those of you who have drifted away from them, from them you'll find a way to drift back to them uh, over the next year or two. Uh, bar associations are important. I think lawyers uh, speaking on nonpartisan issues, but simply issues of justice, uh, are important. And I hope you'll all think about that the next time you receive uh, either a renewal uh, or have an opportunity to sign up and join. So with that, uh, our first panel uh, of the morning, uh, and all I'll do is mention names here, Hank Meyer from Oklahoma City, 
uh, wonderful lawyer and litigator, Randy McGinn from Albuquerque, New Mexico. And by the way, when I tell you where these people are from, that's just where their office is because these people litigate everywhere uh, around the country. Uh, to my left over here, Steve Sussman, who practiced uh, for many years and still does out of Houston, but also has a real presence in New York uh, at this point. And Fred Bartlett, uh, who uh, is one of the legends of the Chicago Bar and who now, I think, is largely headquartered in Colorado, uh, as I understand it. But again, you'll find all of these lawyers everywhere. So with that, again, welcome to the Kansas Legal Revitalization Conference. We hope you enjoy the ride, and uh, uh, let's get it going. So, Hank, it's all yours. Okay. Well, thank you very much, and good morning to everybody. I would like first, to my left, immediate left, Steve Sussman. Uh, Sussman Godfrey started his own firm after graduating from the University of Texas and Yale. I think that you all legendarily should know him as well as Fred Bartlett, who is to his immediate left, who was with Kirkland and Ellis. Uh, Randy McGinn is right here to my right, and I'm happy to be sitting next to her. She's tried about 130 cases, and she told me she's only lost about six. We're trying to get that checked out right now on a fact meter. Yeah. But uh, at any rate, she has taken her honorarium on this, and there are 35 books that she has authored outside that are autographed and they're first come, first serve. Anybody else, I want to go ahead and read to you because I promised that I would. If you want to get it online from trial guides, you can go ahead and use this code LAWLIVES10 and you'll get a discount. But uh, when we take a break in about two hours, we will go through that. Fred Bartlett uh, is an icon. There's absolutely no question about that. And we've had a development of subjects and we want to make something very clear. In if you have questions, instead of waiting until the end, we would like you to raise your hand so that we can answer those questions, the individual speaker or speakers that will address it. So we need your cooperation in that to try to make this a little bit, uh, we think, more fulfilling for you instead of uh, going through today. Um, Sussman, um, I do want to point out from a personal level, I've been opposed to him. And I've also been very, uh, I, I was very fortunate to have his firm deal with a, an attorney malpractice matter that uh, I, I got to use some of the partners in his firm on an ethical basis to give depositions. I have the utmost respect for him personally and for his firm in, the, uh, in that case was in the state of Oklahoma. And I was absolutely amazed at what a fabulous job he'd done to disengage from somebody uh, who's really, uh, a really an anchor uh, against this profession. Randy began, I've known for a long time, and she unfortunately didn't bring some of her uh, video clips, especially about the uh, coyote and the roadrunner that she's used in New Mexico, which I basically lost my mind laughing at uh, when I was in Washington, D.C. Her imagination is, and her ability to be able to be successful in court has been unbelievable. I want to go ahead and bring up the first, we're going to go through a couple of things uh, that we have a trial agreement that I believe is used in Wichita. We also have a pretrial conference order, some suggestions, as well as questions that we're going to address. And that the first question that we have today will probably is going to be handled, I believe, by Mr. Sussman. And that would be, how do you deal with clients who have unreasonable expectations regarding potential outcomes in their case and the potential costs associated with their case. Mr. Sussman? Well, first place, uh, thank you for inviting me to be here. And 
if you have questions, don't count on us being able to see you because with the lights, I could not see anyone out there, basically. So you have to make yourself known. Uh, before I begin answering that question, let me read you something that I found last night. Uh, and this is a statement that I think should kind of uh, guide what we are doing here over the next few days. Most everyone agrees that in the American civil justice system, many important legal rights go unvindicated. Serious losses remain uncompensated, and those called upon to defend their conduct are often forced to spend altogether too much. 80% of the members of the American College of Trial Lawyers report that pretrial costs and delays keep injured parties from bringing valid claims in court. 70% also say attorneys use the threat of discovery and other pretrial costs as a means to force settlements that aren't based on the merits. The upshot, legal services in this country are so expensive that the United States ranks near the bottom of developed nations when it comes to access to counsel in civil cases. The real question is what to do about it. That statement and the ending question was posed last year at the Duke Conference by Neil Gorsuch, our new Supreme Court nominee. And I think the question what to do about it is what this three-day program is all about and what these sub-questions are all about. So the first question is uh, what do you do with clients who have unreasonable expectations about either the cost or the outcome of their cases? Uh, in the first place, you try to avoid representing them. <laughs> you provide them, uh, in, our, in the case of our firm, what we, we, about two-thirds of our work is either a contingent fee or some fixed fee type of arrangement. Uh, we prepare, in each of those cases, a case evaluation memo, which is you, distributed to every lawyer in the firm, and we meet on Wednesday, Wednesdays, and we vote on whether we're going to take on a new case. It's majority rules, except where we advance cost, it requires a two-thirds vote. And these uh, case evaluation memos, we share them with our clients. Uh, they have evaluation of the merits, where the case will be filed, what the fee arrangement will be, what the possible damages will be, and what the problems are going to be. And we, before we even present them to the lawyers, we ask the clients to look at them and approve of them. Uh, you try to get in cases, particularly a contingent fee case, the client to acknowledge in writing what it expects in the way of a recovery because many, many times there's a problem where there was not an understanding going in. I mean, the client comes in and tells you the case is worth $50 million. Uh, I've never seen a case that got more valuable after the first day. They always go down in value. And the only, the only question is, you know, can by the time you have to try them, do you still have a better than 50% chance of winning? Many you don't. Uh, so it's important that you establish with the client that you know, right up, up front, this case, if you want more than $10 million for this case or more than $5 million, you've got to get another lawyer, not me. Um, and the engagement letter is very important. It's the most important document you can draft at the beginning because it should first describe the scope of the representation, such as are you going to defend or not defend permissive counterclaims when they get filed. Uh, does the client have to make a cost deposit? What happens if the client gets behind? What are the conditions of withdrawal? Can you withdraw if you determine that in good faith that the case, the merits of the case suddenly have changed because of a variety of factors? Uh, what's the dispute resolution mechanism? Uh, disclaimers about results and disclaimers about any budgets or estimates you have given of the expenses of the litigation. 
Uh, and then I think it's very important to provide clients with a written description of your philosophy of handling cases, including how do you staff cases and what's your view about discovery? Do you take a lot of discovery or do you take little discovery? Uh, if you're, our, you know, our firm, less is more when it comes to discovery and we very clearly on our website have a description which we ask clients to read how Sussman Godfrey handles cases because we don't always handle them the same way as other firms and if they're looking for a big firm defense or prosecution from my firm they aren't going to get it and they're going to be unhappy. Uh, we make very clear the front, front of the case we do not believe in quid pro demanding a quid pro quo for every accommodation you give to the other side. We do not believe in tit for tat litigation. We do not believe that what's good for the other side is necessarily bad for us. Uh, and we are go only gonna do those tasks in a case which we think are likely to be outcome determinative. And finally, very importantly, we, we trust our young lawyers uh, to do tasks that many firms as signed to senior partners. Uh, and the client must trust us when we assign them these tasks. And if they don't want that, uh, they gotta get another law firm. Uh, so that's what, you, that's what the disclosures you make to the client, the kind of discussion you have on the front end to avoid representing, being hooked on representing someone who will have unreasonable expectations. Now you're hired, how do you control the expectations after the time you sign the fee agreement? Uh, number one, we require our clients to attend weekly case management meetings or phone calls. They have to be on, involved in the case. If they're not, forget it. Uh, we make sure that I have a rule in my firm that our clients get copied on every incoming and outgoing email. No one writes letters anymore, it's all by email. But the clients get copied. Um, and if they don't want cop to be copy, uh, you have to ask the question, why not? What's the problem? Uh, you need a mock trial case early so that you can, mock trials often help you make clients reasonable but they see what a jury is likely to do. So that's important. Um, and on, you know, hourly cases, you just, the biggest problem we get in cases, I think, is we spend too much money preparing them, so then we are stuck having to try them. Uh, and the, the, everyone's expectation is frustrated. The partners in the firm, the clients. So you just have to control and monitor how much you are putting in a case and treat the case as if it were your own. Uh, so uh, those are the kind of things I think you can do. Uh, but we have a... a we submit surveys to our clients whenever we finish a matter. And they respond, and we don't publish their names, but we publish all the results cumulatively on our website. And the question that I am most proud of is when we have a question that, did your lawyers communicate with you? And the question is, sufficiently, excessively, not enough, I am proud that we have about 90% of our clients say excessively. <laughs> I think that is the key. Thank you. Yeah, can, I, can I throw something yes. in? Yeah, so how do you recognize them? Because that's the problem, right? You're halfway through the case and suddenly you realize you have a crazy client, all right? So how do you recognize them up front when they walk in the door? It's the one who comes to you and says, you know, I want the meanest, nastiest person to just give hell to the other side, and I've heard that's you, you know, which you always say, gosh, I guess that's, thank you. Now, and, and as soon as they say that to you, you say, well, you know, I think you've got the wrong lawyer. I, th I think you've got the wrong lawyer. You need to go, if that's what you really want, I'm not your person. You need to go find somebody else, because I'm not gonna do all that. I'm not gonna drag the other people through the mud and all that kind of stuff. I'm not, I'm not just not gonna do that, so go find somebody else. Um, and the thing that I find of, of the list that Steve gave that is the most revealing for our clients when we have an unreasonable client, and you, you, despite all that, you find out in the middle of the case they, they want $50 million, is to show them parts of, uh, how many of you do focus groups, focus groups before your trials? He's talked about mock trials, which is a bigger thing, bigger focus group, but if you do focus groups, 
before your trial or a mock trial is to show the client selected parts of the, of the focus group. We don't usually have them sitting on the focus group because sometimes they say such devastating things about how your client looks and things like that that your client will never want to go to trial. But, but um, so we share with them, uh, we videotape the focus groups and we show, show the problems that might happen as a result uh, sort of selectively to say, let me tell you what could happen and here, look, look at this real life person who might be on your jury and what they think about your case. So that, we find that very helpful in getting them reasonable, I think. So. Fred, do you have anything to add to that? You know, I really don't. I, uh, what Stephen does, particularly, everybody, we have a guy at the client. Guy is men and women. That's the term I use, just so relax. <laughs> but we have a guy at the client that every draft of every brief is an attachment to an email. Every email back and forth the client gets, that cuts out a lot of meetings because they know what's going on and they don't have to call me in and spend a day preparing for a meeting. Client gets all the emails, totally openly transparent. People say, gee, how can you do that? I will say, have the, if somebody sends me an email saying we got a problem here, I'll just routinely be sure the client's on the list. We want them to be part of the team. I say, when you walk in one of our conference rooms and the clients are there and we're there, you shouldn't be able to tell there's people there from more than one firm. Everybody should be able to comment. Everybody's on the same team. You can argue, you can have disputes. We want the client to be enlisted just like a partner in our law firm. And that's basically what Steve does. Fred, if you could take the, uh, the following question. How do you determine what is reasonable in granting accommodations to opponents? When is it necessary to obtain client approval before agreeing to accommodate the opposition? I, I want to start with a little preface. I'm up in Vail last Saturday night. It's the best snow in Vail in years. I've never, we've got like 10 feet of snow on our back deck up there in Potato Patch. We're having a little dinner party, and I mentioned going to Kansas City. And one of my ski buddies up there says, we've got the best snow in Vail we've had in 10 years, and you're going to Kansas City? How come? My wife says, it's this Beach Boy deal. And the guy says, what do you mean the Beach Boy deal? She says, it's part of the Fred Bartlett is still alive tour. <laughs> <It's not laughs> well, I'm 85 years old. I've been trying cases for 57 years, and I'm still trying them. Uh, I said to my wife after they left, I said, you know, Janny, she's a Texas uh, girl from Abilene. I said, if, I w if it was 1960 and I was starting out all over again, for five grand a year to get from there to here. I said, I'm not sure I would have done it. If you knew in advance all the work you have to do, lesson there, I guess. Okay, accommodations to clients uh, and to the, to the other party. side. I teach my young lawyers, it's okay to be a nice guy. There's this deal that trial lawyers are, have to really be mean and snarky and all that. I think that meanness comes from the fact that most people don't try cases anymore. So they write mean letters, and when they go to in court, they're mean, and they threaten people and all that. So rule one is it's okay to be a nice guy. You would be surprised at when you're a nice guy, how often the other person will become a nice person. You know, you just, you're just friendly. You're cheerful. You try to make it work. If the clients are all different, people I've worked with for years, I don't even talk about accommodations, extensions. People say, we can't give an extension, we can't give an extension. I said, you know, who cares? I, you know, I, I believe the judges are like bankers. And try to with, make a withdrawal from a bank before you've made a deposit. Can't do it. So I believe you keep making deposits. It, you don't go to court arguing little things. You say, you can have this, you can have this, as long as you, and I agree totally with what Stephen said. The whole thing is, what is cost outcome? What's going to make a difference? And you operate that way. You know, with a new client, uh, you, you know, they say the same things all the time. We want you to really be mean and don't give any ground. And I always say, you got the wrong guy. Uh, I think the idea of a letter is a good idea. I never thought of that before, so I'm learning something. But you just you, you give an accommodation where it's OK. The other guy's a nice guy. And I don't even think I may want one. I just think, who cares? I'm not going to spend my, I'd be dead by now 
if I worried about all the little things most lawyers worry about. You know, it, you just, just stay above it. If you can give it, give it. If they, now, what happens if the other person is a complete, just a bad person? You try to be nice, you try to be nice. And I've had one trial in my life, case for Teddy Forsman, and I got so I wouldn't even talk to the guy on the other side in the morning. I just ignore him. I didn't get mad. I didn't argue. I didn't threaten. But I said, I'm not going to trouble myself dealing with somebody that's completely unreasonable and is in it for all, to me for all the wrong reasons. So it's, you're just you're a real normal person. You do real normal things. Okay. Steve or Randy, do you have any comments on that? No, I'm, you know, listen, I think most disputes about timing, when things are due, uh, can be handled if judges, as I think all three of us agree, the most important reform that could take place in the civil justice system is for judges at the first of the case to set a firm trial date and to set a firm amount of time. Time limited trial, evenly divided. That's the innovation that's so easy. You don't need a rule change. Every judge has the power to do it. They all should do it. If they do it, then my attitude on the other side wants more time. I say, you can have as much time as you want as long as the trial doesn't get moved. As long as we don't, as long as you don't do something that makes the trial move or gives someone an opportunity to go in and say, well, we need now, we need to move the trial. Take as much time answering it. I don't care when you file an answer, uh, whenever. But the judges that think that they can wait till the end of the case to set a trial date, wait till everything's ready to go to trial, it is like waiting for Godot. It's, you know, that's never gonna happen. It's never gonna be ready. It'll take years and years to get ready for both sides to come in and say, trial's ready, so now we want trial date, judge. That's, so it's, it's, if the judges will cooperate, it's easy for us to be nice to each other. You know, that may, makes me think of another point. Our firm, uh, a small firm, by standards for the cases we handle, and an, an, one of our cases will normally have only four or five lawyers on it, maybe all partners. We have it's like 60 partners and only 10 associates in our law firm, because I believe cases should be handled by people that have done it before, not people that are learning for the first time. So with some frequency, we'll get in, up against a, one of these mega firms, and they'll say they're going to run us out of gas on discovery, and they'll notice 300. We had a case in San Antonio recently. They noticed 200 depositions in two months, expecting me to go to court and, and whine and say, this isn't fair. I've never said that in my life, OK? So what do we do? We get resourceful, and we find a local firm. You know, this time it was Dayberry and Hartford. Good lawyers, nice-sized local firm. And we say, give us four or five of your lawyers who have been USAs or something like that. We get them in a room. I train them up to defend all these third-party depositions, and suddenly, without having to hire a new lawyer, and that's all farmed out and we control the price, if somebody tries to run us out of gas, or it's just a case that's too big for a small firm like ours, we'll just ally ourselves, sometimes with, with people like Williams and Connolly, you know, with good lawyers that are in court all the time to help us during the, the flood season. I always say, if you go down to the Missouri River and there, there's a flood and you see people filling sandbags, guess what? They were not sitting down there for the last 100 years waiting for the 100-year flood to fill sandbags. They were called in from their regular jobs and they fill sandbags. At the typical big law firm, they're filling sandbags all the time and they empty out the sand and charge you 500 bucks and they fill the same sandbag again and they empty out the sandbags. Okay, we staff for the regular thing and if the 100-year flood comes, <laughs> we ally ourselves with, with one of you guys and your firm, we all get along great. And we learn, guess what, there's another firm there. We get a case in that neck of the woods, we, we can do business with them. So we figure out ad hoc ways of solving those problems without going to court and whining and crying and that kind of thing. In New Mexico, there's a, a Spanish saying, mejor un pendejo que dos, which loosely translated means better one jerk than two. <laughs> 
And that's how I think you have to approach accommodations with opposing counsel. You want to be better than the other side. And it's very difficult for our young lawyers in our firm to train them up in that because they say, well, they didn't give us anything in discovery. We should, why are we giving them anything in discovery? They gave us nothing. And you say, well, because one, it's the right thing to do. That's the first thing. You, we want to abide by the rules even though they are not. Um, maybe you model good behavior for the other side, but, but in the end, finally you end up in front of the court on discovery disputes and you say, look, they asked us this same question, we gave them everything, we asked the same question in discovery, they gave us nothing. Um, and so in the end, the judge understands who's, who's abiding by the rules and who is not abiding by the rules. And so if you live your whole life by mejor un pendejo que dos, you will be in great shape. So. Randy, okay to be a nice guy. Yeah. <laughs> Randy, if we could uh, use that as a segue into this next question. How do you recommend dealing with opposing counsel who behave unprofessionally toward you and or your client? Okay, I'm going to come down here because I can't see you guys. So I want to see if there's women out there. Yes. Hello, <laughs> girlfriends. Um, when I first started practicing, there were none. When I, would go, when I would go into a room like this, I'd be the only woman practicing law and the only one sitting in the audience. Um, and so f because I was a unicorn at the beginning, um, I got treated unprofessionally a lot. And so, so I would say to all of you, if you are getting treated unprofessionally, you first have to assess why it's happening. Because they're, you respond based on why it is occurring. So when I first started practicing, there were guys who didn't know what to do with me because I was a woman lawyer. And one day we're going out of a deposition and this elder gentleman starts to open the door and I start to go through it and he slams it on my leg and he says, oh, I'm sorry, my staff told me I'm not supposed to be doing this stuff anymore. All right. <laughs> that guy, you do not give a hard time to because he's trying to do what's right. He just doesn't know what to do with you, you know? So, so for that kind of person, um, you, you give them a break. And I think, that, again, in all things, you start off by saying, all right, is it bad or is it just they don't know how to behave, okay? The second level of things is sometimes, and ladies, this is important for you to know, they are doing it as a strategy. This lawyer on, defense lawyer told me that when he goes into a deposition and there is a woman that he hasn't met before, a woman lawyer that he hasn't met, he always, on purpose, mistakes her for the court reporter because he says it makes her so crazy she can't focus on the deposition, all right? If someone is doing it, you think, for a strategy, you can't get mad. You just do a good job, all right? You just don't let it bug you. And then on the other end, there are people who are actually sexist and racist. I know that will come as a surprise to some of you. <laughs> They hide it really well now. I think it's all out there. You can tell exactly who's sexist and racist now. They've been given permission to be out. So when that happens, <laughs> when that happens, you have to do something about it. Okay, you, you, can't, you can't let it ride. We had a, a judge in New Mexico, a horrible judge, um, who just didn't think women should be practicing law. And when I was practicing, um, he, he would call up just the male lawyers. He would leave the women lawyers sitting back at counsel table. He would just call up the male lawyers. Even if you like, were the only lawyer for the plaintiff, he would just call the male lawyers up. Um, and so one of the women uh, judges um, went to him and said, you can't be doing this. You've got to treat everybody equally. And so the way he dealt with that was to call all of us Mr. So you'd be sitting at council table and he'd say, Mr. McGinn, will you come to the bench? Now, this was before transgender was a thing, you know? So the jurors are looking at you like, what is he doing? Why is he calling you Mr. McGinn? Um, and so we had to then again approach the women judges and say, you gotta, you gotta talk to this guy. Um, uh, it was no surprise after he left the bench that he was the one who shot his wife and shot himself when she was leaving him, all right? So he was just a terrible, person. He was just a horrible, horrible human being all the way around. So when that kind of thing happens, when you think someone is doing something either sexist or racist, I think you have to call them on it. And when it happens in a deposition, the best way to, to I think, um, regulate conduct in a deposition is we, we videotape our own depositions. When somebody is really misbehaving, 
when they are doing sexist or racist things, I signal our videographer to pull the shot back so that the lawyer is on the camera. Okay, so I can show it to the judge and then Steve had a brilliant idea. Steve says the punishment for behaving like that should be you show that to the jury and the judge should let you show that part of the deposition to the jury where someone is misbehaving like that. Um, and the most recent example of that was um, our Muslim client whose daughter was killed by malpractice. And the questions were all about, the first questions were all about their religion, about, about um, doesn't your religion advocate the overthrow of America? That's those the kind of the whole series of questions about religion, and that that you you believe that that uh, infidels do not deserve the truth, so you're going to lie in this deposition, <laughs> and these poor people are just saying, no, that's not what our religion's about. Uh, but but I'm going to use your thing, and I'm going to show that to the jury. Um, and sometimes you have to get the court to intervene if they're if they're really um, being racist and sexist. Um, and, and you can do it a variety of ways. You report it up the chain to the people, senior people in their firm. Um, you can take it to the judge. Um, you can file a bar complaint against them. And, and for those people who are really, you think, misbehaving in that way, I think you take it to the wall for those different people. So that's my view on how you do all that stuff. Yeah. yeah two, I have two quick rules. Rule number one. You know when you get angry, you get that hot feeling, you've all felt it, that's normal, that's the stress hormones and cortisol and adrenaline all coming out. Anytime you get angry, you are losing and the other person is winning. So you just have to train yourself, the second you get that hot feeling rising, I mean, he's insulted me or he's done this, you just have to go, kind of go like this. Well, we'll see. You don't get angry, okay? Rule two, so back uh, when young women just started practicing law, I worked with a lot of young women who all turned out to be really good trial lawyers. Emily Nicklin at Kirkland trained them, and they would come in and say, this guy's really mean. And I'd say, well, I'm gonna get you a case against the meanest son of a bitch in the entire city of Chicago. This is a guy I know well. So I went to the First National Bank, and I said, you got a case against him, yes? So I give her the case. She comes back and she's, Emily Nicklin, believe it or not, she's been around a long time, she's not like this, she's almost in tears. She said, what should I do? I said, ask good questions. I said, I bet you asked a home run question, yes. I said, at the meeting in so-and-so, did Jim Smith say about this, objection, lack of foundation? Every time she said, okay, I said, ask good questions. Were you in New York? Were you in the Pierre Hotel? Were you in a room? Were there other people there? Was it a meeting? Did the meeting have discussions? Did Jones say something? Did you say something? You know, just break it down into the tiny little chunks, unobjectionable, and after they sit there for a while, every time they make the objection, they hear that, they quit making the objection. In other words, be a good lawyer. You know, don't argue about things. You know, I never, if I find one of my young lawyers arguing with the other side of the deposition, I really lose it. There's no reason for that. It's okay to sit there and then say, are you done? Thank you. And then ask a question. And if you do, that will come through, believe me. You, you can control the thing by being a good lawyer and never getting angry and not getting bugged. Plus, the courtroom in the end, if you're a trial lawyer, the courtroom is the great equalizer. If you don't look like what people think a lawyer is supposed to look like, you are different in the courtroom, um, jurors sort of root for you. And, and I've found throughout my career that being a woman has always been an advantage in the courtroom. So no matter how badly some guy on the other side treated me, once we got to the courtroom, I just say, please, please do it in front of the jury. Please behave that way again in front of the jury. And in fact, one time, this guy was being obnoxious and objecting and objecting and objecting, trying to throw me off my stride. And one of the guys in the jury box just stands up and says, now you just leave her alone, the guys. <laughs> because the stereotypes about women cut in our favor in the courtroom. You stand up and make an objection. They say, look, she's doing good. She's, I, doing closing argument, I got close to this woman in the jury box. She just leans this little old lady, leaned over and just patted my arm. And then the closing <laughs> argument, I said, I've got, I've got one. <laughs> 
And so, so remember, you get to go to the court and where all this kind of behavior is going to be bad and, and, and be bad against them. It's going to backfire on them. And so please, please keep treating me like that. Um, and I'm going to ultimately take you out of the courtroom. Steve, did you want to say something? Well, I was telling you, I just uh, read an opinion uh, written uh, January. This came out in January 29th, 27th from a judge in the Northern District of California, motion on sanctions against a lawyer who was taking a deposition and got so mad at the defending counsel that she threw a cup of coffee at him in the deposition. And the magistrate judge writes an opinion sanctioning the lawyer who threw the cup of coffee uh, $250, $250 for, to pay for cleaning his suit. And uh, she analyzes the conduct and, and the defenses that this lawyer uh, who was being sanctioned makes in defending herself. First thing, the first defense is the devil, my opposing counsel, made me do it. <laughs> and the judge says, that, that ain't gonna count. I mean, you can't defend bad conduct by saying you did it. And I thought it was very pertinent, very pertinent, a footnote to something that you just said, Randy, that the judge says here, and I'll find it in one second, she was great. She says uh, in her footnote, uh, as a national figure recently exhorted, when they go low, we go high. Yeah. Both counsel could benefit from taking such advice mm -hmm. to heart. And the other defense that this lawyer had was that, well, I apologized. And so the judge calls that, I apologized, sort of. And, and then another defense was, well, it wasn't that bad. <laughs> All of which got rejected. The final one, don't take it out of my client. And for that, the judge imposes sanctions, not on the client, but on the lawyer. But it's, it's interesting, I mean, Courts are not tolerating this, and clearly they have the power. My, for bad conduct and depositions, to me, that could all be stopped if the judges will only say at the first pretrial conference, anything that happens in a deposition, a deposi I view a deposition as being in court. And so anything you do in a deposition is subject to being shown to a jury. And if I don't, if I, it's reported to me that there were speaking objections or too many objections or any kind of coaching or any kind of misconduct, we're gonna play the whole videotape for the jury. So what, just remember what you do in a deposition, defending a deposition is going to be shown to the jury or can be shown to the jury if the other side wants to. That ends that problem. There will be no misconduct because no one wants, no one would do that in front of a real jury. But be, being a good person, Joe Jamail in Texas, you knew well, had a reputation for sometimes being hard on other lawyers. I was a young lawyer. I had a case against him. I walked in and I said, sir, it's an honor to have this case with you. I've heard so much about you. I said, I hope I can learn some. I wasn't kidding. I mean, I'm a real guy. And I, I said, I hope I can learn some. If me or my guys do things that, you, that bug you, you know, just call me up on the phone. We, he was a prince throughout the whole thing, and we got along great. Everything was done by agreement, because I started out by just being okay. And I was honored to be there, and I did think I could learn things from him. And I've said to women, uh, uh, women lawyers, I'm, I'm, I've heard so much about you. There aren't many people who've done what you've done, and I look forward to this working out fine. And I'm not, this is not bullshit. This is, this is an ordinary guy from the south side of Chicago saying what's in his head instead of being defensive. I do think, I mean, I think we all have a problem. And probably Fred does in his firm. I do in my firm. I mean, it's a problem of, if I'm dealing on a case with Fred Bartlett, it's gonna be real easy for us to deal. A phone call, we know each other, we trust each other. He's not scared of giving a concession to me and I'm not scared of giving a concession to him. Uh, it, but we have been around the block a couple of times. If we delegate communication with each, 
between our firms to a new lawyer, a young lawyer. And that's the tendency to push the responsibility for handling discovery and discovery disputes down to the younger associates in the firm. Then there is a chance that tempers are gonna flare and there's gonna be some fighting. Fred and I were talking about it last night, Randy, that why, do, why does that happen? Well, there's so few opportunities for young lawyers to be real advocates in front of a jury or a court that they tend to do it now over the telephone and in their emails with opposing counsel. They think that's the way I'm gonna be sure I'm tough and I'm gonna show it to the other counsel. So that's one problem. The other problem is that they are afraid that Fred or I will second guess them, that we will think that they gave too much away, so they're kind of scared of their shadows. Uh, and, you know, their inexperience is not right. Now, we can avoid disputes if we have a rule between us that if there's ever any question about who's extensions of time or who's gonna produce or any dispute, you call me, we're gonna talk to each other. We are not gonna leave it to young associates. I'm, of, I'm guilty of that, I must, I'm confessing I'm guilty. And it's the biggest thing I have to worry in my practice going forward that I, I establish the rule and I live by it because it's hard to do. It's hard to say I'm gonna deal with the other side on whether there are too many interrogatories or whether you didn't produce the right 30B6 witness or whether the deposition will be taken in New York or Kansas City. Uh, so I have kind of an alternative worked out in my firm that I think may work, and that is I insist whenever any lawyer on my side communicates with the other side that they copy me on the email. Now, I'm not reading all these emails for sure, but as they get longer, then I begin interested in reading them. And when they, I can tell then from the longer emails and the tone that there is a fight brewing here or likely to brew here. I better intervene now because it's difficult to come in after the people have staked their positions. Then you are not backing your associate. You know, you're not giving the proper, not standing behind the decisions that they make. So, but we need to know about it early to intervene. So I kind of, that's, we kind of follow that rule. I get emails of everything that they send out and everything that comes in. Not that I'm second guessing them, or I'm just watching, monitoring when the temperature gets a little too high. Fred, uh, the next question is, do you have any suggestions or recommendations for, and these are, I think we've addressed some of these facts in here. Any suggestions or recommendations for attempting to establish a good working relationship with opposing counsel who are known to be difficult, unreasonable, and or unethical? Well, I think we've really talked about that. I mean, I believe in, in being a good guy, being a good guy, being nice. If somebody's lying to you, I, I, you know, I'll say, you know, I'm sure that you were a very zealous advocate, and you said this in front of Judge so-and-so, you know, I wish you really wouldn't, you know, I'm trying to be a nice guy, I try to take the, I'm nobody to mess with, I'm not a pushover, but I try to be the way I think you should professionally supposed to be. I've never complained to a judge about the conduct of opposing counsel. I was in, I was in San Antonio a couple of years ago, and, the, and we, were, we took a break. And the other lawyer's standing next to me here, and he's looking at my notes. It's a courtroom's crowded, it's a big case. And the deputy's sitting there, and I said, I said, uh, Mr. Smith, you know, please don't look at my notes. And everybody kind of he kept looking at the notes. I said to him again, you know, I really would like it if you don't read, try to read my notes here. And, and he kept reading notes, and I said, real loud, I looked right at the courtroom deputy. I said, if you keep reading my notes, I'm going to beat the shit out of you when we get out of court. <laughs> the courtroom breaks up, the judge comes in, uh, you know the judge, the, I can't think of his name right now, and I'm looking right at the deputy, and he said, Mr. Bartlett threatened me, Mr. Bartlett threatened me. He said, what happened? I said, she, I said uh, judge, he's reading my notes. And I told him if he kept reading my notes, I was gonna beat the shit out of him. He said, Mr. Bartlett, we're gonna fine you $250 for the battered women's shelter. 
And everybody thought I was a really okay guy and this guy was what he was. I mean, it's okay to be normal. You see what I mean? Now, you might say, if I'm a first year associate, I'm gonna say that in an open court? Yeah, yeah, just do what's right. You know, you, you, you develop a way of doing things. I always tell my lawyers, don't be, try to be a, another Freddy. You know, be a new Emily or a new Karen. Or the a impossible. New yeah, well, but, but, uh, but there's certain basic ways of doing things, and I keep saying it's okay to be a good guy. A good guy says, please don't look at my notes. And after a while, you say with a smile, you keep looking at my notes. <laughs> you know, that's, that's, that's okay to act that way when somebody's a real jerk, but you never go down to their level by getting angry, losing it, doing anything like that. You're always calm. And you know, you know the old story about the swan in the lake? This is what a trial lawyer is. Go to a lake in a zoo where they have swans, and you'll see gliding across the water, calmly, this noble swan like this. What's going on under the water? Just like this, paddling like crazy. That's what a trial lawyer is. You never, you're in total control, you're prepared, you're never exacerbated, you never whine. I, I, one more point, I've gone on too long, but I, young people sometimes say to me, I don't know how, to, what, how I should act. I said, watch some old John Wayne movies, male or female, and act the way John Wayne acts. John Wayne would never say, Your Honor, Your Honor, objection, objection. John Wayne would say, well, stranger, let's look at it this way. Let's take it another way. I mean, just act that way, in a normal way of acting that people admire, not a way of making you seem like you're a whining little baby. Think how John Wayne would act. Well, and see, what I do with the young lawyers in my firm is I try to say, we are going to promote and capitalize, make money off of our being nice. And I do it in the following way. I tell new clients, potential clients that are shopping between me and Fred Bartlett or David Boys or something like that. I say, I'm gonna give you a list of every case I have tried or argument I made where a client has watched, been involved in. Uh, for the last, I give them to them for 20 years. And it, it'll have the phone number of the clients and it has a phone number, how you contact the judge, and it has the name and the phone number of the opposing counsel on that list. It's on my website. You can see, go there today and see that list. I say, I know that's all. My recommendation to anyone who hires a lawyer is go talk to the clients for whom that lawyer lost cases. And go talk to opposing counsel where the lawyer won the case. If the client for the, in the losing case, thinks the lawyer did a good job. You got a pretty good recommendation. And if the law opposing counsel who the lawyer beats says, you know, that guy Sussman, he's a pretty nice guy. He's an honest guy, he's a decent guy, and I enjoyed working with him. Then you have a lawyer who is not going to un unnecessarily pick fights. Fights are expensive in litigation. And if you pick the wrong lawyer, that lawyer's gonna pick fights. Uh, about things that don't matter, and it's gonna cost you a lot of money. And then we keep a record at our firm, as I know Fred does, we talked about last night, of how many clients we get. I mean, it's a large percentage of our current clients in the where we represent companies are people we have been against before. I mean, the best way to get a reference is to be against someone, whoop them, and have them think, you know, that's a pretty decent person, and I'm, I'm gonna hire them. And so, one thing is just convince the lawyers that you work with that being nice is a way to make money. And, you know, you encourage people will be nice there. Being nice and being honest. Sadly, this is one of my pet peeves, sadly, I am almost never in a case where there isn't a whole bunch of lying going on. And it's going on in Washington, D.C., all, both sides in the government lie. It's called spinning. On TV, the commentators are lying. Everybody's lying. And uh, so I, I, when new clients come in, I say, let me tell you something. The other guy here on the other side of this case will lie. Uh, I'm just telling you that right up. And if you want a lawyer who will lie, go hire somebody else. 
I said, I know how to deal with that, but I tell my young lawyers, just imagine, it takes a long time to get a reputation for integrity. And everybody makes mistakes and everybody is an overzealous advocate, believe me. But imagine if you're one of the few law firms where people say, if somebody at Bartlett Beck says something, you can take it to the bank. That's worth everything. It's, it's an investment in a terrific law firm. So all I'm saying is, you know, lying is going to go on. Don't whine. Deal with it. Point it out in a, in a nice way. Jerry Spence, who people disagreed with, but I thought was a great intuitive trial lawyer, said to me once, be the reluctant revealer. Don't sit there with your fangs out waiting to tell the jury that this guy's a lying sack of you know what. Be the reluctant revealer. It's too bad that the world today, where so much money is at stake, people sometimes get carried away and say things that unfortunately just don't stack up. You're the reluctant revealer. Now, there's a lot better ways of doing that, but all I'm saying is you're, you're a nice guy, you take the high road, you never lie. If you make a mistake in front of the jury, say, Your Honor, I overstated. You know, that, that, that I made a mistake, that citation's wrong. In other words, you're a regular guy that admits he's not perfect, admits he makes mistakes, but you never lie, and, you, and you're basically a human being. And reward them for good behavior, all right? So if I'm with a lawyer that, I, that has a reputation for being difficult, uh, when they do something good, like they take a deposition where, or you take a deposition where they're not objecting too much, at the end of the deposition, I will say something like, well, gosh, I had heard you were a, let me see what word I can use for the cameras, an anal aperture. Um, but you did a pretty good deposition there without any, too many objections. So that you reward them for good behavior and try to encourage, and, and you, you lay out, I've heard about your reputation, and gosh, you're behaving much better than what I heard you were going to be. And then they want to do that more, hopefully. That's, that's my one piece of advice. You want to ask our next question? Next question. Uh, Steve, if we could have you comment on this. Have you or would you ever sue a client to recover a fee? Uh, yep. Uh, well, yep and no. Uh, all of our, this is very difficult for me because it's very hypocritical. Uh, all of our fee agreements have an arbitration clause in them, uh, except when we were hired once by the AAJ to represent them in a matter. They would not sign a fee agreement with an arbitration clause. Good for them. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it, is, it is a problem. But have we initiated arbitrations against clients that haven't paid us? Yes. Uh, and, but to do that, you know, we got to have a machinery at the firm. It's got to go through the executive committee. Uh, we make sure that it is a case where it's just a client, where we did the work and we, we deserve the fee. I mean, one of the problems, obviously, is we do a lot of our work is commercial contingent fee litigation. And when you represent a lot of our clients have a willingness to sue when they are unhappy. That's why they came to us in the first place. And we are included, unfortunately, among the people they would sue if we made them unhappy with the result or with a great result which creates a windfall for us. And that's the horrible thing. When you, when you have a contingent fee or a result oriented fee and the client does not want to honor it. Fred has a little different situation. He represents bigger corporations than we typically do. Uh, I think he probably does more defense work than we do. But our situation is typically clients, it's one case, and if we produce a good result and they don't like the windfall and they're, they're sleazy, maybe semi-sleazy to begin with, who knows? they will turn on us. So it's very important that we spend a lot of time, and we do, in uh, making sure that every provision of our fee agreement, which we hire outside law professors, ethics professors, to vet them and to give us opinions that every provision is lawful in the jurisdiction where we are. Because you know there's some jurisdictions where if you overreach in a provision of your fee agreement, 
uh, it can result in forfeiting the entire, you know, windfall rec contingent fee recovery. You can lose your whole contingent fee. So uh, the fee agreements are carefully negotiated. And once you have a really carefully negotiated fee agreement where you've made all the disclosures and the disclaimers, uh, then I think, and, and, and you consult outside help, we will talk to Alas, our insurer, uh, about whether we should, whether they have any problem with our proceeding in an arbitration to recover a fee, and uh, then we we do. Uh, we'll go after someone who does not pay us uh, what we deserve, but it, we do it with a lot of care after we are assured that uh, any, there's no basis whatsoever for any kind of malpractice counterclaim. Randy, if you could uh, give us some of your advice on what is the best way to express respectful disagreement with a judge on a ruling that he or she makes during the trial to, as an example, to exclude what you believe is proper evidence that should have been in or any other ruling that he or she uh, might make. Okay, I, I volunteered to answer this question because I'm really, really bad at this. All right, so let me tell you the, the way I learned how not to do it. So we have a federal case. Uh, we have an all-day hearing. At the end of the hearing, this judge says, well, I'm, here's my ruling after all this evidence, but I'm going to tell you I've got to get off because I've got a conflict because I know one of the witnesses. And I said, well, what about the order? He said, well, just submit the order to the next federal judge, all right? So we're in the big, giant federal courtroom that always are built like cathedrals, so you feel small and weak, you know? And so we're, I'm standing in front of the new federal judge, who was notorious for being a difficult judge, and we hand him the order, and he starts going through the order and saying, ah, no, nah, I'm not going to agree to that, I'm not going to agree to that, I'm not going to agree to that, and I pop up in my little chair and say, hey, wait a second, Judge, you haven't heard any of the evidence on which that judge based all of those rulings. And he looks over from his giant bench and says, are you saying to me, Ms. McGinn, that I can't, I don't have the power to do this? And here's what comes out of my mouth. It's like those cartoons, you know, where the words come out, you're trying to like pull them back. I say, well, I guess you can do anything you want because you're a federal judge. That comes out of my mouth. And I instantly knew that was the wrong thing to say. The steam is coming out of his ears, you know. And I say, you know, it's when you're, you, you said the inside thoughts. You know, you're not supposed to do that. And I immediately then said, oh, my God, Your Honor. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know how that happened. I don't know how that happened. Those words, I was, I was just thinking that, and that just sort of came out of my mouth. And I apologize. I apologize for speaking the truth. I apologize. <laughs> Um, so I'm really, really bad at it. So I have learned when there is a judge doing something to me, and, and, and I'm sort of an Amazon, I just want to fight everything. So uh, I have to take a step back, and I usually consult people at council table about, okay, am I, am I really getting screwed, or, or is there some reason for this ruling against me? Um, and that's why, like in one, one case, again, with a federal judge, um, my, my co-counsel talked me out of setting the giant jar of Vaseline on council table, just as my silent commentary about what was going on in the case. <laughs> so do you think this would be a problem if I did that? you think he'd even notice? You're on a date. No, that's right. <laughs> that's exactly right. It was just, no, no, let's not, let's not do that. Let's not do that. Okay, so, so what is, how do you really deal with it? How have I learned how to deal with it better? Um, it is uh, the magic words, of course, which are, can I make a record on that? Those are the magic words. Can I make a record? And I'm not disagreeing with your honor's sage and wise ruling. I just need to make a record that may, we're going to take up on appeal and get you reversed, all right, in the end. So, so you then very respectfully say, okay, here's the reasons why. Hey, let me go through all this. Here's all the reasons why. And then if it really is critical, you always have the option of asking for interlocutory appeal language to say, you know, this is so serious, your honor, I, I think... Uh, we can't go forward on this unless we have an interlocutory appeal. Will you certify this for interlocutory appeal on this particular issue? So I've learned the magic words and I try to behave. Although occasionally when we're in front of a really, really bad judge, I will tell you that what we, I do for my counsel at table is when I call him your honor, behind my back I do air quotes. <laughs> so if you need to vent, 
that's how I suggest you do it. Okay? <laughs> Can I make a point sure. real quickly? <laughs> Again, you can't make withdrawals from a bank till you've made deposits. We come into courts all the time, <laughs> six weeks before trial on cases that have been around two or three years. We do that all the time. If you start complaining and asking for stuff and asking for stuff and whining and wanting things changed and all that kind of stuff, then you're being marked down as somebody who's not credible. So you give in court for the judge. You know, Your Honor, I haven't thought of that. You're right. I agree to that. I agree. All stuff that doesn't count, you're not whining. So finally, as you get close to trial or you're on trial, you can say, Your Honor, I need 10 minutes after court today because something really important has to be raised. And I've, I've paid my dues. I've got my, my credibility built up. I've given on everything. They know I don't make little stupid, dumb, little whiny arguments. But when I make an argument, it's an important one, so they're, they're going to listen. And I, 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 I'm different, Randy. I would never say I'm going to make a record. That's not like a threat. I never, ever, ever make anything that could be interpreted as a threat to a other lawyer, to the court, to anybody. Because, you know, there's two times you don't make a threat, before you win and after you win. No threats. And I, that, to me, if I were a judge, I, that might get under my saddle a little tiny bit. I'm not being critical. I'm just saying, well, and no, different people can do things in different ways, too. I, I come from a cr criminal defense background, so you have to make a record, by the ah. way. You, you have to make a record, right, Charlie? Yeah. So, so, and that's the key language. They have to let you say what you're going to say so that you make a record on that, too. too. Steve, you, you, were, uh, you had some feelings on this. Well, I, I don't think you, I mean, my, the best way to respect, to tr express your disagreement is to appeal. Yeah. Uh, because I think that's it. I mean, if, you know, if you want the judge to hear something else or to reconsider something, you've got to say, Your Honor, would you entertain a three minute, uh, uh, could I try to explain this in three minutes? And if she says no, <laughs> you just go on. Sit down, yeah. I think also a lot, of, a lot of lawyers, I mean, I've seen lawyers that think that they can win a case before a jury, even if a judge is pissed at them. I've never been able to do that. I've never seen that happen. I mean, maybe it can happen. I think judges have so much power in with the jury to influence what the jury's gonna do, that you better be very, very careful. No, you better not be overconfident in your ability to get the jury to decide with you, although the, you've done things in court that make the, the jury know that the judge is mad at you. Uh, I think that's too dangerous. There's also something that most young lawyers never use ever. It's called an offer of proof. If you're any kind of a lawyer at all, you can anticipate pretty well what are going to be big evidence issues at a trial. It's good to have in your pocket a one paragraph offer of proof. So if the judge denies the evidence, you say, you know, can I make an offer of proof the next break? And then you make an offer of proof that gets his, att I've won cases on offers of proof. Won cases on offers of proof, okay? In other words, this witness, if allowed to testify, would say X, X is relevant to the claim of so-and-so. This witness, if allowed to testify, would say Y. Y is relevant to so-and-so. You're honest, you're direct, but you, the making of the offer of proof really protects the record, and also it kind of gets the judge's attention in a nice way as long as you are a nice person. Let's go on to uh, Fred. Maybe if you could give us some of your advice and sage wisdom that during a deposition you elicit a key admission from the other side and shortly uh, thereafter counsel for the opposing party asks for a recess. Uh, is it proper uh, to resume the deposition with a discussion about what subjects were covered by opposing counsel in the recess with their client? Well, you got to know the law of the state. In Delaware, in the Delaware Chancery Court, it's considered wrong once the deposition is started for the lawyer to take a break and talk to his witness. It's good to know that because then you can ask the question, you know, the Delaware rule says so-and-so, Mr. Witness, did he talk to you at the break? Okay, but local rules and local practice are all different. I, if the lawyer's a good guy and we've been getting along fine, I would say, Steve, you know, this issue just came up. 
you know, please don't talk to your witness. I know you wouldn't do it anyway. I just, it's my ethical duty to do this. And, and if you're going to do it, you'll probably say, well, Fred, I have a right to talk to him. And then, then I said, well, then I have a right to examine him. But I've, I've been open and fair, and I've not laid myself open to surprises. I don't like surprises. I like the other side to have surprises. Steve, do you have any thoughts on that? I, I really don't. I have nothing to add to that. Let's go on to the next question then. Randy, if we could kind of get your thoughts on, if you suspect that opposing counsel is struggling with the issues that are causing him or her to neglect your opposing party's legal representation, what obligations, if any, do you have? That's every case. <laughs> <laughs> So if it's going to help your case, do you just shut up? Is that an advantage for you? If they, if they have a drug problem or an alcohol problem, they're showing up drunk, um, do you just say nothing? Um, and I guess your answer to that depends on how you view the legal system and what our role in the legal system is. Um, you know, the, Shakespeare said, the first thing you do is kill all the lawyers. What people forget is that that was a conversation between character, two characters in Henry V about if you want anarchy or if you want revolution or dictatorship, that's the first thing to do. Is you kill off the lawyers who are the line between what's right and what's just and the rest of society. I mean, that's how uh, it works. So my first day of law school, uh, my professor said, told us the story of the Godfather, the very first Godfather. For those of you young people who haven't seen it, you need to go watch it. First, one of the first scenes in the Godfather is it's the Godfather's wedding day, and people can come on the Godfather's daughter's wedding day, his daughter's wedding day, and ask him for any favor. And the guy comes in and says, Godfather, um, my daughter was raped. Um, and the two men, because they had positions of privilege, got away with it. And the godfather says, well, what do you want me to do? And the guy says, I want you to kill them because it's, I didn't get justice. The godfather says, well, they didn't kill your daughter. They left her alive, so we'll just break their legs. We'll go be the, break their legs. And that's the justice. And the guy says, thank you very much. And he leaves. And what my law professor said was, this is what you're charged with. If the legal system doesn't work correctly, people will take the law into their own hands. And, and I see our job as that. What I was charged with my first day of law school was to make sure the law works correctly so people don't have to take to the streets to find justice. And I think each of us in this time are called on that even more and called to make deep moral choices about would we, if we thought a law was wrong, if we thought it would piss off a client or we thought we'd get fired, or we thought there'd be blowback, would we stand up for what's right? And, and in this time, I think, regardless of what your politics are, when you see someone or a lawyer or a judge standing up for what they think is right and enforcing the law, I think it is our obligation to support them, regardless of your political affiliation. Because I think the law is under assault right now, too. Having said all that, what do you do if the other person on the other side has a drug or alcohol problem. I think the higher calling is to serve what's best for the law and the legal process. Uh, you cannot have a fair hearing if the person who's coming to every deposition is stoned, if, if, if their client is unaware of it and if their law firm is unaware of it. And so I've had that very situation happen, and my call was to go to the senior members of the firm and tell them. You've got, a, you've got somebody working for you that's got a drug problem. He's showing up, reeking of marijuana, um, and he's at every deposition stoned. And you need to know that, and you need to have an intervention with the guy. Um, and, and that's my take on serving not just your client, because that's not really our charge. Our charge is to make the law work correctly and make the system work correctly and stand up for the law. And so my advice to you would be to always find some way to approach them. And if, if they're a sole practitioner, um, I, our, our um, bar has a way you can report people anonymously, and then they'll go in and do it. The, the bar itself will do an intervention 
with the person. And so if there is not someone in their firm to go to, so they can pull them off the case and get somebody competent and maybe have an intervention, um, I would report them to the bar anonymously and say, you need to go have an intervention with this person because they've got a drug or alcohol problem. So that's my advice. You know, there's a related question uh, to that. It's 1960 and I'm 28 years old and I'm, uh, my old dad had said, I said, how do I succeed? I went to public schools and everybody else went to Harvard and Yale and Princeton, everything, and he said, find something nobody else wants to do and get good at it. I noticed people talked about trying cases, but they didn't really want to do it, so I'm trying a lot of cases. Every case I can get my hands on in the law firm, I take a few deaths and end up trying it. My investigator, a guy named Joe Gallo, said to me, and this is important for you young people, he said, Fred, if you keep trying cases at this rate, you'll be an alcoholic by the time you're 50. I said, what do you mean? He said, I've seen it over and over. You try these cases, and there, every case there's pressure. The, the, a a billion-dollar case is not more pressure than a $20 million case or a $5 million case, because we're on the line all the time. We're the NFL QBs. And he said, and maybe uh, you go home on Friday after court, and you have a drink, and it really feels good. And that felt so good that maybe on a Thursday night you have one drink. And then maybe on Tuesday night, after a hard witness, you, you give yourself a drink. And, and we saw it, and you've seen it many times in, in people. They, they, he said there, were, there are no 55-year-old sober trial lawyers. This is 1960, remember. It's a different world. And so there's a warning there. There's a whole new thing you all, you young people, have to learn uh, which we don't have time for today, but there are recognized ways of accepting pressure and creating good pressure instead of bad pressure. If pressure, if, if, you, if you conceive trials as bad pressure, the chances of abuses of different kinds or even quitting. I had a young woman, sadly, about 10 years ago, and some people just don't like conflict. They just don't like it. And she came in and I said, Helen, you don't like this trial stuff, do you? She said, I don't. I said, you know, you don't. Why are you doing it? She said, well, my dad thought it would be great for me to be a woman trial lawyer. I said, don't do it. You're not cut out for this continual being told you're wrong and fighting and all this stuff. So she left my firm, went with another firm, got into litigation, and killed herself. So don't underestimate the pressure destroys more decent trial lawyers than being dumb destroys, and you have to learn how to deal with it. I've often said that there ought to be whole two-day deals devoted to learning how to deal with pressure when you're going to get a witness. Your client says, you've got to do a good job here, and we all feel it. You feel this <gasps> inside you, even though I'm 85 years old and I've done this for 57 years. But you have to recognize that. That's the way you are supposed to feel. If you don't feel that pressure, then, then you're either dumb or you're a drunk. So you have to, but, but I'm, I don't want to go on about this, but you all need to think about pressure, you need to think about stress hormones, you need to think about physical conditioning, and you have to learn how to deal with the pressure or you should get in some other line of business. Let's, uh, let's move on to the next big topic right here, technology in the law. How has it affected the firms, the practice of law, in the last 20, 25 years. Steve? Uh, that's mine? Well, no, it's going to be. I think all three of you, listen, I'll it is technology and law. It, it means that we can seamlessly, you know, I think one of the reasons that uh, it's so easy for me to continue practicing law in to tell you the truth, I'm so glad I came here because I really didn't know. Fred and I knew each other a long time ago. I haven't been in touch with him for about 10 years. It is so reassuring to me that I have another, with his Beach Boy tour, that I have another nine years <laughs> to keep another doing 20. this. Well, I hope it's <laughs> another 20, Fred. And uh, uh, because, uh, and you know, so why do we love, why are we loving it so much? One of the reasons we're loving it is that technology allows us to be lawyers without really distinct, you know, it's not work for me. When I, I, I'm looking at my computer in the morning at four o'clock or five o'clock and reading emails and 
It's all part of my life. I can do it in my house in Aspen. He does it in Vail. We work on our vacation. We don't work. It's, we, we do that. We keep our minds active. Is it work? Is it play? Who knows? Is, are we just keep, you know, keeping busy? But it's fun. And, and so I think technology has allowed us, when I began practicing law, uh, you, you had to go to the office to practice law. All the books were there. All your papers were there. Uh, you know, you had to make a choice. Were you going to go home and have dinner with your family or, uh, and go back to the office? Or, but that, my son, who's a lawyer now, he's 48 years old, he's a partner of mine, he didn't have to make those choices. He didn't ha never had to make those choices. He could be available for games and, and life. So technology has been wonderful for us and allowed us all to look at the practice as something that is joyful and wonderful and we can do it from anywhere and you know I carry a uh, I have always been when I hear guys in my office don't give out their cell phone numbers I say are you kidding see I always have the belief that I'm gonna get this great call from Fred Bartlett at some weird hour mm -hmm. and I will be in Italy or Russia or on some exotic vacation and if he can't get me he's going to refer the case elsewhere so all of my phones are forwarded to my cell phone. I mean, I'm constantly available for anyone to call me. And I mean, having that technology available enables me to be in England or Italy or wherever I want to be uh, and be on conference calls and handle cases. No one that needs to know where I am. And uh, uh, so in any event, I mean, I think technology has been great for us. Uh, obviously, the young lawyers, we've all gotten written we don't have any libraries at our firms anymore. That space is saved. Uh, I have off, when you go, it, it's just a different world we're in now. Uh, I, I don't want, I wonder why we even have offices. It's very expensive, it's a lot of overhead. Uh, I would imagine when I walk around my firm's offices, uh, about 10% of the offices on average are occupied, the other 90% are empty. The lawyers either are working from home or working on the road or somewhere. They, they aren't in the office. And I wonder why in the world <laughs> are we paying all this money for physical space? I mean, I think we're moving in the direction of not having physical offices. I think we're moving in a lot. I, so I think technology uh, is, and I've been talking as part of my you know, we need to figure out on jury, the, the thing about jury service is the reason that it's so disgusting to most people is that they get summoned, they go to the courthouse, they waste a lot of time and they aren't selected. Or they, in many jurisdictions, have to sit the weeks of, of non-judicially supervised voir dire, where, I mean, that's the way it is in many state courts, like in New York or Connecticut, uh, and they hate the system. So why can't we select a jury completely by internet? They fill out a questionnaire, we exercise our peremptories, we research them over the, I mean, you, uh, the, we research them over the internet and uh, when people come to the courthouse, they are on juries, period. Uh, we could do that. We have the technology available to do that. Uh, if I can buy uh, a $100,000 car over the internet in about 10 minutes and put it on a credit card, Certainly, we should be able to pick jurors over the internet. Uh, we are probably headed in the direct mock trials. I mean, there's services now that are doing mock trials, virtual mock trials. You don't even have to go somewhere. They have a panel, you do that. Artificial intelligence is on the way. Predictive coding is here, uh, where you know the computers select the documents you produce. The computers select the documents you don't produce. It's all done by computers. Uh, and even artificial intelligence, obviously. You put in a, read a, a case pattern into a computer and it's gonna tell you who's gonna win and who's not gonna win. Uh, and what the results are gonna be and what the issues are and what case you need to go read. So I, I do think that, uh, you know, it's, but that's fine. So a lot of lawyers will be displaced. Uh, I think one of the problems with the legal profession today, professionalism, is that because we're already being displaced by so many things, uh, firms are looking for all these make-work projects. You know, they, I mean, really, 
how can they build out their armies of associates uh, when, uh, you know, what's going to happen if, I mean, how are we going to review documents in big cases if we can't have free trade with India so that people can sit at their computer screens at some town in India and review documents before they're produced? I mean, you know, if we eliminate free trade, it's going to affect our practice. So I just, I think technology's here. I think it's great. I think the lawyers have got to be on the cutting edge. I have always admired Fred's firm for being on the cut of it, cutting edge of technology in the courtroom. They do it better than any firm I've ever seen. Uh, I mean, you know, they operate their own equipment and all that, and it's pretty impressive. Fred, why don't you? Can, at Bartlett Beck, no lawyers work in the evening unless they're actually on trial. They go home, they have dinner with their family, they read to the kid, and then they have these things called computers which enable you to communicate from anywhere. Nobody is ever in the office on the weekend, none. I want my lawyers to have happy wives. I want their kids to be happy. I want them to go to their kids' events. I want them to be real people who travel the world and don't spend all their time you know, putting in FaceTime for the boss. I could prove to you in a 10-minute display, I thought of putting this on sometime, I can prepare a cross-examination now in two hours that 25 years ago took me 10 hours, me personally. And, but it turns everything upside down because in the typical big firm, you're going to take a deposition, you call, say an associate, do a deposition outline. The associate's never seen a trial. The associate has no idea how to set up a witness, but the associate knows I better not miss something or my boss will be mad. So the, the outline of the deposition is 100 pages long and it's about, got about two good ideas in it, okay? The computer turns it upside down. I do the first draft of every deposition I take. I should be able to do it. If I don't know the case as well as the other people in the firm, I shouldn't be on the case. So I do an outline of the deposition, the subject matter. Uh, there's something called Mavis Beacon. You know what Mavis Beacon is? I, know, I couldn't type in 1985. Now I'm 80 words a minute because I got a software called Mavis Beacon and it works on your weak fingers and you're flying through it. Working fast and accurate is work better than working slow. And I'll tell you one more, depositions. Every deposition that our firm, in any case we're involved in, is up in the cloud. Any changes that I make, notes I put in a deposition, go up in the cloud. My clients have access to the cloud, and they can look at every deposition I've taken and see that I then went through the deposition, put the notes in, basically abstracted it. And this is what Fred Barlett is actually doing work. And this is what he thinks. And if he, I say, if you see things in there, that they don't even have to tell me they have a password to the, all of my work product up there in the cloud, and they can check what I'm doing. Now, we don't bill by the hour, so it's kind of nice that they know we're actually doing work and all that kind of stuff. But just, just think about that, how tra totally transparent we are. One last story. I'm, at, I'm the head of one of the biggest, most successful firms in America about 1986. And for years, I've thought about computers. I was an engineer in my youth, and I thought they, they should have some value in law. Remember, how many people here have ever seen a DOS prompt? Okay, the young people haven't. It was a, you'd have a black screen in the upper left-hand corner would be a little green thing called the DOS prompt, and you put in codes and they'd come out and all that. Then a guy said to me, you know, there's this new thing called Windows. This is about 1987, and it's really stable, and I never, work much with the DOS prompt. So I'm there in my office busily going away about 1986. One of my partners comes in and says, what are you doing? I said, I'm working on a deposition. She, he said, well, you're typing. He said, I pay women to do that. That was the mentality back then. And I said, oh, I see. You take a mixture of lead and graphite, surround it with a hexagonal piece of wood, and make indecipherable notes on a yellow pad, which you then have to dictate out and revise and revise. And I make fast, accurate notes that I can mail out from my computer. And your system, yeah, he said, yes, Fred. He said, if people see you typing, they'll think you're a sissy. <laughs> and I thought to myself, that's about when I decided to start my own firm. I get to compete with guys like that. <laughs> but <clears throat> Steve does not overstate 
the life, if you figure out how to use technology, it, can, it'll, it will change your life, it'll make everything faster, it'll make you way more accurate, and it'll give people a life. At Kirkland, we had to be there every Saturday, we had to be there every Sunday, we worked evenings and all that kind of stuff. And I'm proud to say my law firm works as hard as anybody, but they work at home. Nobody has to be away from their family on weekends sitting in the office because they hope that the boss sees them. And that's, you put your finger on it, that's about as big a change as you could ever imagine because we get, we get our lives back. I'm going down the Nile on a houseboat two years ago in Egypt, and I'm writing a brief for United Technologies. And it's dawn, and you can hear they're calling people to prayer, and you were going slowly down the, the Nile, and I'm typing on my computer and sending it up to a satellite and sending it back to the client in, in Hartford to edit and come back to me. And he didn't even know where in the world I was. I didn't, back then, the bill for that was about $10,000 an hour. Thank God that's changed, you know. But everything changes. You get your life back, and you, it's faster and better. I would have quit 20 years ago if I wasn't good at computers. I would have quit. Why do that, all that pencil stuff? Randy? Yep. So let me t tell about the good part of technology and the bad part of technology for the practice of law. Good part is I'm not in a big firm like these guys. I've got uh, five, oh, there are five women partners and two male associates in our firm. Doesn't seem quite fair, does it, guys? Um, the great part about technology is you can finally bust all these big corporations when they lie to you. Okay? First time this happened was in a case against, of all people, the Boy Scouts of America. Shouldn't those guys be honest to you? Shouldn't they tell you the truth? Isn't, what's the Boy Scout code? Does anybody know it? Be prepared with all that stuff. Right? But honest, honest, he's upright, honest, all that stuff. Anyway, so um, here's, the, here's the case. It only happened because it was guys involved, not women. All right? They asked a bunch of volunteers to go out to this camp in New Mexico and got all these, these sort of weekend warriors out there, about 10 guys, and said to them, we'd like you to cut down the giant dead trees to make it safe. Now, um, to a man, you ask a woman to do that, she would say, are you out of your mind? Cut down trees? To a man, they said, oh my gosh, what a great thing. And they said, we've got these chainsaws for you to use. No one had ever used a chainsaw. One guy said, I've always wanted to use a chainsaw <laughs> to cut something down. There is a reason why logging is the most dangerous industry in the nation, you know, because it's, it's Dangerous stuff. So they, here's what they do. They, they, this tree is like by a, by a line right here. And uh, the guys say, I've got a great idea. Let's tie a winch. That's a winch on the front of the truck, not a wench. Uh, <laughs> tie a winch to the tree. And, and there's no road up here, so we'll run it around this other tree and this Rube Goldberg thing down to the road where the truck is with the winch. And we'll just all start pulling on the tree with this winch. Uh, loggers will tell you you've got to stay at least two tree lengths away because a tree could hit another tree and knock it down on you and kill you. So what, where are all these guys standing? They're all standing because they want to see the chainsaw all right here behind the tree, right? To watch the chainsaw. And what you're supposed to be watching is the top of the tree to see if it falls on your head. And of course they start pulling with the winch and the top 20 feet of the tree go fall off backwards, hit my guy on the head. He doesn't come out of the hospital for 18 months. Okay, that's the, that's the case. We asked the Boy Scouts of America, have you ever had anything like this happen before? Absolutely, is it like this, Mr. Boy Scout? Absolutely not. We have never had this happen before. We get online, we find out, they bring this guy to come in and testify. We've never had this happen before. How could we possibly know that something like this would happen? We get online, we find that this guy lives in Arizona that they bring in, 30 miles away from where he was a year before our case happened. They had a scout killed doing this same thing, the same exact thing. But do we tell them, no, we let them take the stand and say, isn't the Boy Scout rule that you're supposed to be honest and brave and clean? I don't understand the clean part of that. But, but <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am, we are. And we get to cross-examine them at trial. And so for the first time, and we're finding that in all kinds of things. When corporations say, we've never had this happen before, what do you know? You do an internet search, you can find it all. They cannot lie to you anymore. That's the great part of the internet. It let, lets little people like us take on big corporations and catch them when they're lying, OK? And, and if, if you think you can get away with anything these days, ask John Edwards how that worked out. Um, <laughs> the bad part of it is we don't talk to each other anymore, right? 
Uh, Steve's going to have some great suggestions about having face-to-face -face contact. We email, 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 where are we text, and you got to figure out, the hard part for me is figuring out how the other person responds. Some people only respond to text, some people only respond to emails. Nobody calls each other anymore or sits down and meets face-to-face -face with each other. And it is easier to be a jerk in an email than it is face-to-face. And the danger of emails, of course, is they send you some flaming email and you just immediately sit down and back at them. Um, and so our rule in our office is when you are angry, when you feel what Fred talked about, that anger hot. boiling up, that when you feel the hot, you can write it, but you can't send it for 24 hours, okay? You can write it and get all that anger out, but you cannot send it for 24 hours until you've had some time to think about it. The other downside of being connected to everything and our jurors being connected to everything is I don't know how we can really expect jurors um, to not access information when they're in trial. I know we give them instructions and you're not allowed to go on the internet and you're not, but they all have their phones. So, so the first thing the judge has to do is say, I'm gonna take everybody's phone away from them. You can't take it away from them at nighttime. You can only take it away during the trial, right? Because people need it to contact their families and that kind of thing, because they have it now, their computer is right here in their hand. And I've got to tell you, if I want a jury and there was a really serious issue, you know how they used to send out notes, can you send in a dictionary to define this term? Why, why would any young person say, if, if, especially if it was important, even if you've been instructed not to get online and there was some dispute about a term or a dispute about something, and you thought this case was important enough, why would you not get on, why would you not Google the term and find out what it meant and use it in the jury room, whether you do it during trial or after trial? And you're not doing it for bad reasons, you want to get the right answer. And then of course there's the problem with the internet, which is, what the hell is the right answer on the internet, right? You can get 16 different answers, and depending on what news service you, you um, connect with, you get the answer that sort of uh, reinforces whatever you believe, you know? The, the promise of the internet was that we'd all be smarter because we'd have access to both sides of an argument. None of us seem to do that. We sort of find the one that we like, and for crazy people, you find the crazy person that you like, and you just get crazier and crazier and crazier because that's who you're listening to, all right? Um, so how do we deal with that? That's an issue I think we all have to talk about and try to deal with. Um, because I think it's coming, and I think one of the things we have to fight for jury trials, because I think somebody's gonna propose, why do we have 12 people come in? Why don't we just put the evidence on and people can watch it online, and then we can, the whole community can vote. Talk about a huge mess, what a huge mess. That would be both sides would be trying to put stuff online to support their side that people could research. I mean, we have all kinds of interesting issues that are coming up in the future based on technology. So. Thank Lawyer, you. Lawyers do Mr. that now. Yeah. Lawyers alter their websites <coughs> when there's a jury trial, not to put false stuff in, but to shape their own resume and that of the law firm to fit the kind of case that is coming along. If it's an EOC case, it shows you know what the kind of employees you have and how great you are to people and all the money you give to the battered women's shelter and all that kind of stuff. Lawyers are changing their websites depending on the case they're trying because they know damn well the juror is going to look for them. Mr. Sussman, if we could uh, have you kind of open up your thoughts on your pre-trial uh, agreements and also your trial agreements, and we're going to need, if this is a period of time, if you have questions, please bring them up during this because right. this is going to take a little bit of time. Now, I'm going to try to get this fairly quickly. About 20 years ago, I came up with the idea. I was on the chairman of the Texas Supreme Court uh, Rules Committee uh, proposing new rules. And I realized that the rulemaking process is very cumbersome. It takes a long time. And what you end up with is the lowest common denominator, uh, not anything invented or creative or efficient or helpful. And I came to the idea that, well, why can't we make our most of my cases were large cases. I have mostly good lawyers on the other side, so why can't we make our own rules? And came up with this idea of having pretrial agreements uh, where you, uh, the key is that at the beginning of the case, not while you're in the heat of battle, where everyone thinks it's what's good for me is not good, what's good for the other side is not good for me and vice versa. But right at the beginning, 
you propose a series of agreements, which are really rules about how pretrial discovery is going to operate, to the other side. Uh, have I had a case where all of my agreements are agreed to? Never. Have I had cases where 80 or 90 percent of them are? Yes. I've had some cases where I've never had a case where nothing is agreed to. Uh, lawyers get too embarrassed to agree to nothing. So, and what you're trying to do is start a discussion and a negotiation with lawyers on the other side about what rules are going to govern. And so, and we, for about 10 years, I was working on pretrial agreements, and about 10 years ago, I said, well, now I'm going to have some trial agreements going to the phase of trial. So, there are 15 pretrial agreements and about 20 trial agreements. You have them all. They were sent out. They're on the website. There's a website called trialbyagreement.com. They're with your materials. They were supposed to be made available to everyone. And, uh, you know, and my recommendation is that these will not all work. Uh, and m many of these have been changed. They're changed. I change them all the time. I, I, the last changes on these were made on Monday because I, in New York, I met a lawyer named Paul Saunders who was the head of litigation at Cravath, and then he was in charge of the American College of Trial Lawyers. He's a defense lawyer. And I'm regarded mostly as a plaintiff's lawyer. So I thought if I could get someone like Paul Saunders, who was head of the American College uh, effort last year or the year before, to come up with proposals to facilitate civil discovery and make it faster and cheaper, that they did a task force and report, that if I could get him to buy off on them, uh, they would be great. He redlined these agreements. I incorporate them on Monday. Uh, yesterday we talked and exchanged further ideas and I finally got his buy off and now his name is on this too and before the end of the week I'm gonna get Fred Bartlett's name on it hopefully Fred will look at him carefully and send me an email at redline so that now we'll have and the idea is the more lawyers we get endorse him well the judges have found out about these two and a lot of judges are doing what I urge all judges to do is that get counsel in at the first pretrial conference, tell them to get a copy of these agreements and go meet with the other lawyer in the jury room for 15 minutes and come back and tell me what you can and cannot agree to. And you're free to modify them. You're free to suggest other agreements. But I want you to make your own rules and I want you to do it now. And so uh, just if you walk, uh, I've got, uh, uh, yeah, the first agreement, and some of these are like, this one's outdated already. I need to change this one. Uh, 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 Randy made it clear to me that now e we have replaced phone calls with email. So I've got to go back here and say, to any discovery response, the lead lawyers will try to resolve it by phone, period. No one will write letters e or email. Okay, because this was at a time when email was inventive. Now people, are, the emails are getting longer and longer, more argumentative. If we could only get the lead lawyers talking to each other, that would be great. But that's one that at the beginning of the case, we will request from the court a trial setting, a, trial, a request for a trial lasting blank hours, 10 hours, 20 hours, divided evenly, set to start on a fixed date. We, we will go to some courts. You know, the, the judges, some judges, judges react differently to these. Some judges will say, it's my court, it's my courtroom, and we're going to do things my way. And other judges will say, which hopefully you will have some judges like this, will say, I'm whistling to listen. And if the two lawyers, these are good lawyers, if they are agreeable on these things, why should I stand in the way of doing it? And so, you know, again, encourage you're not going to know whether the judge will do this. And too many times I've heard lawyers excuse their inaction, uh, their inertia, by saying that Judge Jones will never do things this way. She wants to do them. I know what she wants. Don't accept that. I mean, you know, if we're ever going to, if we're going to solve the problem that the nominee for the Supreme Court pointed out, that access to the courts is disappearing. Uh, public dispute resolution is disappearing. It's all being privatized because in arbitration you can make your own rules, which is exactly what JAMS and AAA are trying to do. Make their own rules which are better than the rules in the courthouse. 
the judges know that. They're going to work. They're quitting their judgeships and going to work and make money for those organizations. Uh, so we can make our own rules. We don't have to go to JAMS or AAA to get special rules. And uh, this is one. Uh, depositions. Now, here we're going to agree that uh, each side gets 10 depositions. And I forgot to change this. The agreements, and I forgot to change the PowerPoint because the agreements themselves say each deposition will last for three hours. It used to be six hours. Now I've gotten Paul Saunders and everyone, I've gotten lawyers to agree to three hour depositions. And you get, uh, you know, each side gets 10 depositions. Or you can do it in terms of the number of hours, but agree on the front end. There's no case, there's no deposition you can't complete in three hours, period. If you don't waste time, if you, if you go for what matters, and if the other side is not spending a lot of time. To make sure you can get it done, you provide that all depos at depositions, all objections to relevance, lack of foundation, non-responsive speculation in the form of the questions will be reserved until the time of trial. So there will be no reason for the defending lawyer uh, to make these speaking objections, which take a lot of time and are used simply to coach, woodshed the witness on the job. Uh, and again, if counsel act up and they violate this rule, the result gets played to the jury. Uh, now, some people are going to, some lawyers will tell you, well, I don't want to. Uh, I had Paul Sanders actually in the written copy of the instructions. I've inserted something here. The PowerPoint did not even get changed from when he said, well, I would like the other lawyer to make objections to form because I can correct those at the deposition. I said, Paul, make it at the option of the deposition taker. So if you want them to be made, I'll make the objection. But if I'm happy, and I am, that I can ask the right question the first time, I don't care if you reserve your objections. You can make them whenever you want to. I don't need to know. I don't need your help in asking a proper question. He agreed. We made that change. So it's now the, the written version of these agreements is different than the PowerPoint slide. Uh, the parties will use, the, this is simple, the same court reporter and videographer. Um, all papers, cert this is old, real old. I don't think you can do it any other way in most courts now. That agreement I should probably drop out. Documents produced on a rolling basis, clearly no one objects to that usually. Um, this is one that is very difficult to get agreement to uh, because it is novel. Uh, everyone complains that the biggest expense in litigation is the expense of electronic discovery. Electronic discovery is expensive not because it costs more money to locate the documents or produce them. That's what computers are about. Computers should make discovery cheaper, not more expensive. The expense is because you can get so much, you can locate so many documents by computer that it takes a lot of time if you and the client are gonna insist upon having a lawyer look at them first before they're produced uh, to remove irrelevant documents or privileged documents. That's what's time consuming and expensive. The expense is on reviewing the documents you locate before they're produced. If you have an agreement that each side's gonna identify five witnesses on the other side, you're gonna identify a time period that counts and you're gonna get all their emails during that time period which have their name on them. Uh, except those emails that, that have a lawyer's name in the to or from or BCC line or CC line. So the computer can identify the lawyers. Uh, that can be withheld. Uh, it, it, it can, you can produce real cheaply. And then you have a clawback and you have an order entered under the federal rules of evidence that provides that uh, the privilege is maintained in every other suit. It's not waived by producing a document which is privileged and you should get that kind of order. I think it's a 502 order. That should be given in every case. Um, I, I'm in a case in New York now where we are spending hours and hours arguing over the terms of a protective order. Well, are we gonna have an attorney's eyes only provision? And you know, it's abused. That's always abused if you have an attorney's eyes only provision. And yet, is it worth arguing about? The other side's not gonna produce anything until we get an agreement. And so here's just a way to cut through that. 
it, there'll be a disagreement. We both file a letter with the court, no argument. We give the court our version and let the court choose. Trial exhibits, no objection to this. I've, everyone will agree to this if you just suggest it, uh, the way that you number them. Uh, imaging is the same way. Uh, Pre-trial agreements, uh, this is uh, on witness expert reports. Uh, now, part of my pretrial agreement has already been adopted by the federal rules. Uh, you do not get draft expert reports, or you do not get communications between counsel and experts in discovery. The federal rules make that immune from discovery. They followed the Sussman agreements. The third one has not been followed, and that is I would have an agreement that if you get an expert report and no deposition, no depositions of expert. That is suggested by the American College of Trial Lawyers, that you cannot get expert depositions except upon good cause. You've got to file a motion with the court. I would have it part of the agreement that the only way you get expert reports at depositions if you can demonstrate to the court that there's something in the report that you really don't understand, which is rarely the case. Uh, and uh, I'm going to just run through this. This is an important one here. This is number 14. Uh, today, where documents are hidden in plain view is on these 200-page privilege logs. Uh, and so, the, because people put everything on a privilege log. And uh, this is a, a system where each side can pick, peremptor, peremp peremptorily pick, 20 documents off the other side's privilege log and the judge or magistrate will, magistrate judge, will agree to uh, look at them in camera. And it keeps everyone honest if you have this agreement because if the judge finds that of the 20 documents, 10 of them should not have been listed as privilege, then uh, you can ask for additional ones. The, the agreements provide you can go back and get more uh, or that, that I think our agreements now say that if the judge doesn't like uh, your selection of privileged documents, uh, then they, you can hire a master who will review all your documents and you pay for it. Uh, and now we turn to trial agreements. I'm gonna run through them briefly because almost all of these, and really it's through the trial agreements that I got involved in all this thing, how we're gonna save jury trials. Uh, and so in the trial agreement, the first big trial agreement, it's an innovation being used around the country, do away with the pretrial order. The pretrial order is the biggest make work, waste of time, uh, boon to hourly billing law firms, known of to man. So get rid of it. Uh, and all you really need is a witness list, an exhibit list, uh, deposition designations, and uh, jury instructions. Part of the pretrial order, but you don't need everything else. You know, issues of law, issues of facts, stipulations, forget that. Um, uh, this is an important one. If a name shows up on the real witness list, and the witness list needs to be real, not these may call and will call lists, but all will call. If a name shows up on the will call list that you have not deposed, you have between the time you get the list and the time of trial to depose that witness, if you want. So you don't have to go to depose every witness trying to guess which ones may be called, really called, at trial. Uh, and again, we're going to divide the time allotted equally, uh, and each party will get a set amount of time. We'll agree on the amount of time to open. Normally 30 minutes, close normally an hour. If you, it should not be more than 30 minutes. And to open, it should not be more than an hour or so to close. Uh, that would be my suggestion. Uh, deposition designations. We spend a fortune with young lawyers reading all these depositions and designating them. The deposition designations never get, they never see the light of day. No one is spending time in, in a time limited trial while each side gets 10 hours. An idiot will waste time sh reading or showing depositions. You want it all live witnesses. So why spend all the time time with designations. We're going to have a just-in-time designation regime where if you really need and think you're going to present something, 48 hours in advance, you present the other side the clips you want to show the jury. They get to counter-designate clips and objections, and the judge rules on them just in time to let it be shown to the jury. 
So you don't need this comprehensive deposition designation, which is, is a huge expense and a waste of time. Um, how you play depositions at trial should be agreed to, and against whose time does the, re the playing of a deposition count? Uh, an agreed motion in limine. Uh, there's an exhibit A, which you have in your materials, uh, that has the things that every lawyer should be willing to agree to, whether you're plaintiff or defendant. They're common things. They are non-controversial things. Uh, we have gotten crazy. You know why it's costing so much money to try jury cases? Because the judges have allowed motions in limine to become second summary judgment motions or second Daubert motions. And therefore, there are dozens and dozens of motions in limine. And you spend two days deciding what a jury's going to hear and what should only be a two-day trial. That's ridiculous. Um, uh, how you're going to exchange exhibits with the other side. Um, and the limitation will be on these exhibits. It does not go on the list unless you, in good faith, intend to show it to the jury. Okay? So if that's the test, we aren't going to have these 500 exhibit lists for a trial where you're going to get 15 hours each side or 20 hours a side. That's ridiculous. Uh, and if you get that kind of list, you can go to the judge and say, Judge, we agree that we would only put on this list what we really intended to show the jury. This lawyer can't possibly tell you that she's going to show all these uh, things to a jury in the time allotted. Um, unobjected to jury exhibits listed uh, are admitted into evidence at the time the trial begins. And I add to that the caveat, if they are actually mentioned during the trial. So any unexhibited, un, unobjected to exhibit you can mention in opening, you can use right away. And the minute you mention it, it becomes an exhibit. Now, if you don't mention it, it doesn't become exhibit, and that's the check on the agreement that all the exhibits are intended to be uh, mentioned. Uh, in any event, uh, uh, exchange of a questionnaire, a juror notebook, um, letting the juror take notes, uh, and letting the juror uh, ask questions. Uh, that is uh, uh, agreement number 13. Uh, every juror that we have interviewed says they want the opportunity to ask questions. 90% uh, of the judges who have allowed jurors to ask questions think it's a great thing. It does not take up additional time. Jurors love it. It engages them. And so virtually every... If, if you're in a court that's not allowing jurors to ask questions, you are in a very primitive court. Uh, notice an agreement how you're going to notify each other about witnesses. Uh, whether demonstratives have to be listed on the exhibit list or not. Um, substantive preliminary instructions should be, we should agree that the judge should give them. What are the elements of the liability? What should the jury be looking for? What will the issues be? Uh, we're not talking about these boilerplate uh, preliminary instructions on burden of proof or things like that. But I'm talking about what, what do you have to show to prove securities fraud uh, or uh, the violation of Section 1 of the Sherman Act. Uh, what are the elements? And we should agree on it. And we should also agree that if we are in a case where there is a pattern instruction, the pattern instruction will be used. No one will be making these, uh, you know, paste and cut instructions where you get something from every case that you like and the other side then gets something from every case that they like. The instructions become totally incomprehensible. We go with a pattern if there is a pattern with no revision. Uh, and that's an agreement you make in advance, okay, before you know what the instructions are going to be. Uh, you ask the court to instruct the jury before you argue, not after you argue, which is a change from what the federal rules provide but many state courts do it in this sensible way. You should, the lawyer should not have to argue the cases if they don't know what the instructions are going to be. We do. Um, the, you need to ask the court in advance, agree with the other side, 
give every juror a copy of your instructions in writing and a copy of the verdict form. Uh, requesting real-time reporting, uh, sharing the cost of audiovisual equipment, and uh, allowing the lawyers some interim argument. Uh, so many minutes to be used while the witness is on the stand. So uh, those are the agreements. You may agree or disagree with them. You may have other ideas. By the way, this is all a living product. If you've got ideas on these agreements to change them or improve them or on other subjects, send me an email. Uh, go to the website and there's a place for you to put comments or add stuff at the website. Thank you on the agreements. Thank you all very, very much. Uh, I believe they will be around. Each one, make sure you get your book. Do you have any questions right now? Or at the break. I mean, anybody yeah. wants to come up and ask anything, fine. There's, gentlemen, yes, sir. I'm not, I'm not quite as old as you are, but I need help typing. What was the name of the program? Mavis, Mavis Beacon, M-A-V-I-S-B-E-A-C-O-N. It's great. These fingers, you know, and old people, see how they curl under? Pick, you get fast on those. Thank you all very, very much. I thank each one of you.